Welcome you all to first service. Um, my name is Elliot, and if you haven't seen me, I have been on the worship team before, and it's been a while since I've been on this stage. Uh, today, I just wanted to introduce you a new song. It's called Grace to Grace by Hillsong. Um, there's three things that it reminds me of. Um, the first thing is that it reminds me of patience. When we want certain things, maybe we're a little impatient on certain things. God is cooking for something for us up there or down here as well. Um, the second thing I'd like to point out is that the song also reminds me of heaven and praise, um, glory to God, Jesus and the cross, but most of all praise and adoration. And the last thing that, of course, in the title, grace. Grace can mean God's favor uh, toward the unworthy. It can also mean the gift that God has given us. When we want to follow God, we have to give ourselves up and humble ourselves. As the composers said uh, about this song is that, it's grace upon grace and upon grace. So I invite you to come worship with us and stand, please. If love. If love's endured that ancient cross How precious is my Savior's blood The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame The image of love upon the death's frame If having my heart was worth the pain What joy could you see beyond the grave If love found my soul would die Victorious, my chains are gone, my debt is paid, from death to life, and grace. Savior's God, the 
victorious My chains are gone My debt is paid From death to life And grace to grace When I see that cross When I see that cross I see freedom When I see that grave I see Jesus from death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. From death to life, I will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. When I see that cross, I see freedom. When I see that grave, I see Jesus. Your praise in the wonder of your grace. How my soul will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace. How my soul will sing your praise.
scripture reading will come from Psalm chapter 71 verses 14 to 19. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long, though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I'll proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, who is like you, God?
Let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we look to the cross and what you've done for us, Lord, that you died for us, that you shed your blood, God, that we can be forgiven of our sin, that we can be made right with you, and that we can experience eternal life both here and now and forevermore. And Lord, we are so thankful. And as we look at the things that have gone on this week in our life, Lord, we give praise to you, Lord, for your answered prayers, for your faithfulness, for your help, Lord, in our time of need. And so we do pray, God, that you continue to bless us, to be with us, and Lord, as we continue to go through different struggles, whatever they may be, whether they are financially, whether they are health issues, whether there are relational issues, Lord, that we need to experience healing. God, we bring that all to you right now. And we invite your Holy Spirit to come, Lord, and transform us. Transform us from the inside out. Transform our situations. God, that we can give you praise for your goodness. For you are a good God who gives good gifts to his children. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would be with us, Lord. That you would raise up your church Lord, to follow you, to deliver your message to the world, and Lord, to love others in this community. God, that people would come to know who you are, that you are a God who loves them, who made them, and who has a greater plan and purpose for their life. So help us, Lord God, for we are weak, Lord. We are weak, we are feeble, we need your strength for each and every day. And so we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning for English service to those in person and those joining us online. Uh, You can feel free right now. You can just kind of turn around and you can wave and greet one another this morning. And then you can have a seat. I'd like to welcome you as well. If you're here, if you're worshiping with us for the first time, uh, I'm not going to make you stand up and wave and all that kind of stuff like that, but um, we see you and we want to welcome you here both Maybe you're watching online for the first time as well. 
uh, and we do have uh, little, um, little pamphlets, uh, just information, general information for the church, and also to be able to get your information so we can, the pastors can get to know you, and maybe you're interested in either a life group or a fellowship group, or you want to know more about children's ministry, things like that. We'd love to get connected with you so then you can be more, yeah, get more involved in the life of the church here. And so just a couple of announcements to bring to your attention. Uh, first one, again, is for uh, Sandra Wright Shen. Uh, she'll be coming to perform in September, September 17th. And also, uh, she will be here on the Sunday morning that weekend as well. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, and she is doing, if you've been to the previous ones, uh, she is doing uh, new pieces uh, for this performance. So, yeah, come and invite your friends. Uh, a great way to connect people through music um, to the gospel. So, uh, next one is for ECBC podcast. Um, so, we do have, uh, for those who are looking for our, our sermons and you're like, you don't want to watch uh, the videos on YouTube, but you like, you have time to listen either on the radio or like, uh, at home when you're doing things. Uh, we do have uh, all the sermons um, cropped out just in audio format, and you can just uh, check it out there. Uh, you can go onto the, the website, and I believe there'll be a link to uh, some of our, wherever you get podcasts, that's, that's there. Uh, next one is for the ECBC Summer Picnic. So that is coming up next week, uh, next Sunday, uh, after first service, so at 10.45. Uh, so if you haven't gotten tickets yet, or you have people that you'd like to invite to that, um, please do get those uh, in the foyer. Uh, their tickets are $5. And also, uh, just a reminder, just to, to bring your own chairs, you can bring your own mats, um, if you want to sit. But if you just want to stand and run around and stuff, like that, that's, that's cool too. But yeah. And that'll be at, uh, so it's not going to be in the back parking lot like uh, last month. It's going to be at Fraser Foreshore Park, which is kind of down the road that way. Towards the water. Just go towards the water. If you see the water, then you made it. So, well, you may go went too far. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And then the last announcement is for VBS. And so uh, this past week we had VBS, and the theme was SunQuest Rainforest, and we had a fun, a great fun time with the kids. There's like 140 plus children here, and um, yeah, we went on an adventure uh, to find Jesus and to discover. Uh, eternal life. And so the kids had a great time. Um, it was so much fun um, and so much hard work too. I know that every single day when I went home, I like, I totally crashed. And then like on Saturday was like, just like the great sleep. You just like, you just like slept and didn't wake up and just like, yeah, there's a lot of energy and just like love that was poured into VBS. And so thank you so much to all the volunteers ad from adults to, to the teens uh, and everyone in between um, who prayed for the kids and who uh, put in that effort um, just to, to serve them. And yeah, so very, very thankful for that. And so with that in mind, we do have a video uh, just kind of recapping some of the stuff that happened during VBS. So hit the video. On God's word, on God's word, my house will stand tall.
Good morning. I just want to echo again what Pastor Phil said. Thank you so much to many of you here that volunteered. I think we had over 40 volunteers, 40 plus volunteers for the week. So thank you so much to all of you who were a part of that, from cooking food to uh, being in the classrooms with the kids themselves. This morning um, in our series on uh, Ask Me Anything, we're going to be taking a look at a topic that uh, I would often avoid from the pulpit especially, but I think it's especially important uh, right now that we talk about. And I don't speak from uh, uh, someone who has it all figured out. I'm still working it through myself and what it means uh, to be spiritually discerning and then taking that and applying it to something like politics. So today, if you put to the next slide there, we're going to be taking a look at this topic of spiritual discernment and politics. Uh, discernment and politics have come up in conversations that I've had with a number of you over the past couple of years. And we, I think we'd all agree that we live in times that are very confusing. We live in a time where people can get very extreme, polarized views. We live in a time where conspiracy theories can spread quickly, rapidly over the internet, the internet which we're all using to help us make decisions. And uh, we're not going to have time in 30 minutes to cover everything that can be talked about in spiritual discernment and the area of politics. So what I'm hoping to do this morning is to begin the conversation where we have further discussion, further conversations about this big topic. Um, I'm going to show a, um, a trailer from a next, that's put out by Netflix. It's called, uh, it's, it's a trailer based on something called The Social Dilemma. Perhaps you've seen it already. Perhaps you haven't. If you haven't yet seen it on Netflix, I really encourage you to watch it. Uh, before we show the, the trailer, I want to uh, g- tell you what they say at the beginning, because you might miss it. And what they say at the beginning really sets you up for everything else that's said uh, in this documentary. So uh, what will be said is that, in, in case you miss this, is that when you and I type in Google search these words, climate change is, climate change is, we're going to get different results depending upon where we live and depending upon what Google already knows about you and I, about our preferences, our likes and our dislikes. In other words, what comes up on your particular search is biased. And it's biased intentionally, on purpose. So here's the trailer uh, on uh, this uh, documentary called The Social Dilemma. When you go to Google and type in climate change is, you're going to see different results depending on where you live and the particular things that Google knows about your interests. That's not by accident, that's a design technique. What I want people to know is that everything they're doing online is being watched, is being tracked. Every single action you take is carefully monitored and recorded. A lot of people think Google's just a search box and Facebook's just a place to see what my friends are doing. What they don't realize is there's entire teams of engineers whose job is to use your psychology against you. I was the co-inventor of the Facebook like button. I was the president of Pinterest. Google. Twitter. Instagram. There were meaningful changes happening around the world because of these platforms. I think we were naive about the flip side of that coin. We get rewarded by parts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. A whole generation is more anxious, more depressed. I always felt like fundamentally it was a force for good. I don't know if I feel that way anymore. Facebook discovered that they were able to affect real-world behavior and emotions without ever triggering the user's awareness. They are completely clueless. Fake news spreads six times faster than true news. We're being bombarded with rumors. If everyone's entitled to their own facts, there's really no need for people to come together. In fact, there's really no need for people to interact. We have less control over who we are and what we really believe. If you want to control the population of your country, there has never been a tool as effective as Facebook. We built these things and we have a responsibility to change it. 
the intention could be, how do we make the world better? If technology creates mass chaos, loneliness, more polarization, more election hacking, more inability to focus on the real issues, we're toast. This is checkmate on humanity. Thanks, tech team, for showing that. Before we go any further, I invite you to bow your heads with me, and let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning as your people. We need um, your wisdom, your insight, as we live in these often very difficult, confusing times. So we pray, Lord, that you would lead us, you would guide us, and, and this morning, Lord, as we take a look at this topic, that you would help us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. So how do we navigate living in today's world? How do we make decisions when you and I often go to the internet to get the information that we need in order to make the decisions that we make when we know that what we're searching is biased towards what we already think individually? Not just as a group, but actually individually. Now, I'm assuming that all of us here in this room and those watching online want to make wise decisions. And I'm assuming uh, that as Christians, you want to live lives that honor God in the decisions that you make. And so with those assumptions, I think a really important place that we start when we want to make wise decisions is looking at Scripture and looking at what Scripture has to say about what it means to be a wise person. Now, there's lots of passages all the way through Scripture, Old and New Testament. There are even books that are considered wisdom literature, all on this topic of wisdom. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, the letter of James are wisdom literature. Now, the book of Proverbs begins with these words, Proverbs 1, verses 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right, just, fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now this word wisdom is used 41 times in Proverbs. And what it means, it includes a meaning of skill in living. Skill in living well. I think we all want to live well. The skill in living well involves following God and God's design for life. The New Testament says that ultimately Jesus is the wisdom of God. And so in other words, if you really want to be a wise person, you need to know to have God. Proverbs 1 uses words like prudent life, knowledge, discretion, guidance, doing what's right and just and fair. Now, prudence means good judgment, good sense. And then in the term prudence to the simple, this word simple, it's another key word in Proverbs. It's used quite often. And it refers to those who are easily persuaded, those who lack judgment, those who are immature and perhaps are, um, they, have, they haven't got a lot of, they're naive, they haven't got a lot of experience in life. You know, life can be complex, can't it? The person who has learned to navigate life's difficulties is called the wise person. And then we read in, here in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And some translations have, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that is echoed elsewhere in Scripture in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, knowledge and wisdom, these two words are qu qu uh, very cl closely linked throughout Proverbs. Um, it's interesting. Knowledge 
or, or, or yeah, the word knowledge, we often think of in our world today, it's, it's acquiring bits of information. It's not about how we apply it so much, it's that we just get the information. But in Scripture, this word knowledge is, means to have correct understanding of the world, world and our relationship with God. It doesn't separate the two. We have a correct understanding, not just any understanding, a correct understanding of the world and our relationship with the one who made the world. And then wisdom is the acquired, it's the learned skill of applying that knowledge. Skill in the art of godly living. Now what does it mean biblically to fear God? It includes a reverence for God that involves humbly coming before him, submitting to his lordship, to him being king, to his commands in scripture. So God is Lord, God is king, and as we sang earlier, God is also friend and father. All of these describe a relationship that we can have with God. And in this relationship, we receive God's wisdom, its guidance, in making the wise decisions that we need. But what's important here is that we seek the guide and not just the guidance. And this is an important distinction because often we seek guidance and then later we forget about the guide. Let me explain. We often want guidance, and while God, he ultimately prioritizes relationship. So we may uh, come to God and we'll ask him for, for wisdom and making a decision about which school we should go to, what career we should take, who we should marry, what investments we should make, what house we should buy. And then we're fervently in prayer with God, and then once we've made that decision, we then stop our prayer. We stop communicating with God. We've got what we want, and we don't come back to God again until we have another issue that comes up, another area where we need wisdom and discernment. And wow, God, he wants that continuous relationship with us. So God, he'll even, he won't even, sometimes, he'll, he won't tell us too far in the future. Sometimes we want to know, well, Lord, what's way ahead here? And if you've noticed, often, I, I, I've, I've found that with myself, and I find very few people who have a, a long-term vision of knowing what God wants exactly. Because God wants us to depend upon him in all of our decisions, step by step. And so it's like cobblestones in a pathway. And each step we take we have to call out to him and ask for wisdom and discernment. He won't give us a long-term vision too far ahead because he wants us to stay dependent upon him. There are several common myths that Christians believe around spiritual discernment and making decisions. Uh, this morning, we only have a few, 30 minutes. We don't have time to take a look at all of them. But there are a couple of books that I really encourage you to, to read. One of them is here by uh, J.I. Packer and Carol Nystrom. It's Guard Us, Guide Us, Divine Leading in Life's Decisions. A really good book. The other one by Gordon Smith, another really good book. It's a little bit easier to read, and it's learning to listen, uh, sorry, Listening to God in Times of Choice, The Art of Decision, uh, Discerning God's Will. I've read both books. They're both excellent. I'd really encourage you to, to get them out. And some of these myths come from, from these books. So I'm just going to discuss four of the myths. There's a number, uh, but number one, because Christians have the Holy Spirit, we automatically make wise decisions. That's a myth. Now, Jesus does say in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. We have the spirit of God within us. If we have submitted our lives to Christ, if we've asked him to be Lord and Savior. He has come in and he dwells there. But that doesn't automatically make us good listeners to God. And that doesn't make us automatically wise in understanding all of Scripture. As a matter of fact, well, there's examples in Scripture where even the apostles misheard or misread God. Uh, at one point, Paul and the apostles, they were on a, mis a, a, a missionary uh, trip, and they assumed they should be evangelizing one area, and the Holy Spirit kept on closing door after door, and then eventually opened another for them. 
you and I often assume that God's will is the same as our wills. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. And so humility is really important when discerning God's will. Myth number two, there's only one way to do the will of God. I think there's a whole paradigm shift that we have to have as Christians. Uh, When I first heard this, I first read it, I, I didn't really grasp what was being said here. But let me try and explain it. We often think as Christians that God has a wonderful plan for our lives. What's better than a plan is that God has a wonderful purpose for our lives. You see, a plan is like a blueprint. It's like a map in our minds. And we think there's only one way to do this. And if we make a mistake, then we're out of God's plan. Often, God will present us with several choices, good choices, and we can choose which one to take. In other words, there isn't a plan, a blueprint. There's this purpose that God has for us, a purpose of being in relationship with him, a purpose of walking in his ways, of being wise and discerning his guidance. This is linked to another myth that when you and I make a mistake, We have to go back and start all over again if we can. But the fact is, sometimes we can't go back. If we're all honest with ourselves, we can all look back and say, you know, I've made some mistakes in life. And we've had to come before God, seek his forgiveness, and then God continues then to guide us. We make bad choices sometimes, but God can sometimes, or he does. He weaves these into the tapestry of our lives. He can redeem these bad choices that we sometimes make. Romans 8.28, we read these words. It's a wonderful promise. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God can work out good according to his purpose. Sometimes people are so terrified of making the wrong choice because they think there's only this blueprint, this map, that they become paralyzed. They can't make a decision for fear of making the wrong decision. God can turn even bad situations around if we trust him. Another myth in discerning God's will is that it's always difficult to discern God's will. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessarily always easy to discern God's will, but it doesn't have to be always difficult. God has given us his word, which gives us his general will for how he wants us to live. God has given us his Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And if we're open, if we're sensitive, if we're willing in humility to listen to what the Spirit has to say to us, we can be guided by the Spirit. And God has also given us community, He's given us the local church. He's given us one another. We can come to mature Christians and say, you know, I need your prayer to help me discern what God is desiring for me in these next few steps. He's given us one another. What can be difficult in discerning God's will is that often we want life to be black and white. Open this door, but don't open that door. We don't do well when there's multiple good doors that can be opened. God has given us minds. He's given us minds to love him with. He's given us minds to be spiritually discerning. And that requires that we think. It requires that we pray. It requires that we take time to draw close to him for wisdom in our complex world. And I've spoken to a couple of groups, student groups in the past, and I think to our young adults here on this uh, topic of of, uh, myths and discerning God's will. 
Uh, and a- after one of those talks, one of my coworkers came up and said, you know, this is all good, but how do we apply this to a particular situation? Now, politics is an area that touches all of our lives, whether it's making decisions about who we're going to vote for or it's about following the laws of our nation. We're all touched by politics. And so this is just the beginning of the conversation, and, and I do this with a little bit of, well, with a lot of fear and trepidation because I realize that in this room, we have differences of opinion, and that's okay. It's okay because all of us are different by design. We have different personalities, we have different spiritual gifts. We have different talents. We, have, we bring to this church our differences. But these differences can help us to better discern what God is saying to us corporately. In other words, we need each other, and we need each other's differences. If we have a common faith in Jesus Christ, and we're determined to not allow ourselves to be divided but we want to stay united in Christ. There is so much misinformation out there. There is so many um, wrong theories out there, false news, uh, conspiracy theories. Recently, politics has been linked to the COVID vaccine mandates, fake news, and even to conspiracy theories. One recent example was the conspiracy theory uh, that Uh, Bill Gates had somehow put a microchip into the vaccine, and therefore you shouldn't take this vaccine, because if you do, he will control your mind because he wants to control the world. Christians, just like everybody else, can get misled, confused, misinformed, and sadly polarized in our views. We really need wisdom and discernment in this age. Now, as I said, having different opinions is okay. Okay. We need one another's differences. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 to 22, the Apostle Paul writes these words to a church that had been given the false news, the fake news, that Jesus had already risen. And this is what he wrote. Inspired by the Spirit, test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. Now this word test means to sift to sift out the bad and to hold on tightly to the true and the good. To do that as Christians, we need to compare what we read, what we hear, with what God has already said in his word. And then we need to apply God's truth. But how we apply God's truth is going to be different. At least we have different opinions about how it should be applied. And this is why we need each other. We're all in some ways influenced by the culture we live in. We can't get away from culture. God has called us to live in two kingdoms at the same time. The kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And these two kingdoms are connected, but they are also very different. When we went through the Gospel of Matthew, we read these repeated words by Jesus. The first will be last, and the last will be first. That is not the way this world thinks. It's not the way this world operates. The values, the morals, the ways of God and his kingdom are often very different from the values, the morals, the ways of this world. And yet, at the same time, you and I are called to be salt and light in this world. And you and I cannot be salt and light effectively unless we're in the world. We're engaged with the world. In the fall, I hope to teach an EBI class uh, looking at Scripture and then asking this question, how do we now apply this to the world that we live in? How do we engage with society at the same time being uh, faithful to Jesus Christ? Now, some Christians would argue we shouldn't engage with the world at all. There's just no way it's secular. It doesn't think of God. We shouldn't be involved. The Amish are an example of this. The Amish, they live in their own, usually self-sufficient communities. They don't use modern conveniences. They don't drive cars. They, use tr- they wear traditional clothing without buttons. There's a reason for that. Uh, there's another extreme view of how Christians should engage culture, and that's to... 
uncritically embrace everything Canadian society has to offer. They uncritically um, mix politics and culture, love of country with their faith. Others argue for a complete separation of church and state. Both positions sometimes Christians will hold to. This idea of this complete separation and this mixing of the two. And I would argue that neither of them are biblical. If by separation a person means that a Christian should completely separate their faith from their politics. To think about and engage politics biblically, we need to take a look at what Scripture has to say about this subject. And it's interesting, the Old Testament pays much more attention to those who are in positions of authority, such as judges and kings and lawgivers, than it does to the activities of priests. Very interesting. Clearly, God has something to say about governments. Now, please turn with me in your Bibles, your Bible apps. We're taking a look at Romans chapter 13. And we're going to go back to this passage a couple of times. Romans chapter 13, it's one that's often looked at when it comes to Christians' interactions with government. And it goes like this. Everyone must submit themselves to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Notice that this is repeated twice. Authorities have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I'm not sure if you saw the news it's either yesterday or the day before on CTV. Maybe it was on CBC as well. There was a, uh, in Ottawa, there's a church. I don't think it's the church, but there's some people who are in the church who uh, have declared themselves to be an independent entity. They do not have to follow any of the laws of Canada. They obviously have not read this passage. Government as an institution is something established by God. Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, tells Peter and the Pharisees, pay your taxes to the government. He says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. In that case, it was tax money. And to God, what is God's, meaning our very selves. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 2, he urged that prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and for all of those in authority. Peter, in 1 Peter, he writes this, fear God and honor the king. At the same time, Scripture tells us that there is a limit to Christian submission. If you recall, we went through our series in 1 Peter. We read this passage that was really key to understanding all of 1 Peter. And it's 1 Peter 12 to 13, or 12 to 14. Live such good lives amongst unbelievers. We are supposed to be engaged in culture. Live such good lives amongst unbelievers unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds, glorify God on the day he visits. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Peter writes this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, at a time when Christians were facing persecution from cruel Emperor Nero. Nero was terrible. He persecuted Christians, and yet, inspired by the Spirit, Peter writes these words. Now, this word submit, as we looked at it when we went through 1 and 2 Peter, is qualified. And it's qualified, importantly, by the words, for the Lord's sake or on account of the Lord. Similarly, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, we are told to submit to one another in the church out of reverence for Christ. Now, this phrase, submit yourself for the Lord's sake out of reverence for Christ, is at the heart of everything that follows in chapters 2 and 3 of 1 Peter, and at, and at the heart of much of what's said in the letter of Ephesians. 
Christians are told to submit to various levels of authority for the Lord's sake. And this submission is guided by, it's limited to these words, for the Lord's sake. It's because Christ is Lord, and it's because Caesar isn't Lord that we submit to the government. It's because Jesus is Lord that we're to show proper respect to all people, regardless of who they vote for, regardless of their political opinions, regardless if we, re- we uh, agree with our government or not. We're asked to submit, and we're asked to um, show proper respect to them. Now, in 1 Peter 2.12, we're told to engage in society by doing good to people. In verse 13, we're told to submit to every human authority. But what do we do with this word, every? What about this authority? What about that situation? In Romans 13, human authorities, we're told, ultimately get their authority from God. John 19, 11, Jesus said the same thing to Pilate. So Pilate, first century Rome, governments today, they get their, ultimately, their authority from God. This fact, though, in no way justifies wrong or unjust use of that authority. It only points to the fact that those in power, whether they're Christian or not, ultimately owe their power to God, whether they recognize him or not. However, God can take away their authority if it's wrongly used. There's a limit to Christian submission. Jesus submitted to the authorities of his day. And yet at the same time, he challenged the religious authorities. It's, it's, it's interesting, though, he didn't challenge the civil government authorities. He only challenged the religious authorities. John the Baptist confronted Herod when Herod had married his brother's wife. But again, it wasn't over politics. It was over moral issues. When the Sanhedrin brought uh, Peter and John to them and told them to stop sharing about Jesus, to stop speaking about Jesus, to stop telling people about him, Peter and John said, no, we can't do that. And so we submit to every human authority for the Lord's sake. If our submission isn't going to honor God, then we can no longer submit. Our primary allegiance as Christians always has to be to God and to his kingdom. At the same time, God calls us to engage with this world. We live in two kingdoms at the same time. And so Robert Banks and Paul Stevens, in their book, the complete uh, book of uh, everyday Christianity, they write this about politics. that They point out that some countries, in some countries, almost half the GDP, the gross domestic product, is handled by the government. And if we as Christians want to be good stewards of the resources that God has given us, then we need to engage with, to be involved in politics. And if we want to be a positive influence on society, again, we need to be engaged with politics. We're called to love God and to love people, both those who acknowledge God and those who don't. And this demands that we be involved God makes the rain fall on both the godly and the ungodly. As Christians, we're called by God to advance the greater good for everybody, regardless of what they believe. Now, Banks and Stevens, they note that throughout history, Christians have at times been a major voice in society championing justice, compassion, integrity, freedom, Christians historically have been involved in both the party that was in power as well as the opposition because both sides need a Christian voice. William Wilberforce is a great example of this. He was encouraged by John Newton, the John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace, to um, oppose and abolish slavery. He was a Christian. He was a British MP. And he used his position to gather support across party lines, across nationalities, and eventually he, as a Christian politician, was able to abolish the slave trade all over the British Empire, which then led to the abolition of slavery all over the world. The Bible doesn't argue for one particular model of government, doesn't argue for one particular political party, 
But Scripture does provide guidelines for how these leaders are supposed to lead. They're to lead as servants, not lording it over others. Leaders should be just in their treatment of others, protecting the rights of all. Leaders are to defend the poor, the orphan, the widow. Governments are to be impartial, not being influenced by bribery, corruption. But regardless of how good a government is, no human institution, political or otherwise, is perfect. All governments have limitations. No government is going to get rid of all of the social ills in society. And that's because, of course, they're caused by sin. And no government has the power over sin. There's limits. Rather than think of a government as a means to solve all of society's problems, we should see it as one means that can be used to fight for the common good. But what happens when the common good, determined by the government, is different from the morals and the values that we see in Scripture? What do we then do as Christians? We live in a world where God allows us to make choices. And some of those choices are bad, wrong choices. God gave Adam and Eve the the ability to make a choice. And their wrong choice has negatively influenced us until today. God gave them and he gives us the freedom to choose right and wrong, to obey him or to be independent of him. And if God is not going to force people to follow him, we as Christians and the political power that we have, we cannot force others who do not believe God, who do not follow God's values and morals, the word of God, we can't force them to follow our values, morals, the ways of the Bible. God doesn't do it, and we cannot. Now, thankfully, we live in a democracy, and we can vote We can lobby. We can encourage our MPs. We can do all sorts. We can even demonstrate publicly, peacefully, for what we think is right and wrong. But God has called you and I to live in two different kingdoms. We are citizens of both, but ultimately our allegiance is to the kingdom of God. But because we live in two kingdoms, we have to learn to live with the tension that sometimes there are going to be laws that we don't agree with, but we still have to follow within this area of submission to the government. The Bible instructs us that our political leaders in our country can't claim total allegiance from us. A prime minister, a court of law, a country's constitution can't claim final authority. And this brings us to a term that you may be already familiar with or maybe not, nationalism, and in particular, Christian nationalism, which has been growing in various countries. At different times in history, it's been very prominent. I found a questionnaire on the internet, a questionnaire on the internet which I think will help us to identify Christian nationalism. Now, I have shortened the, the questionnaire. Um, And it's very American, but hopefully it'll help you to see uh, why Christian nationalism is actually quite dangerous. So let's put up the questionnaire. Okay, so fill in these blanks with either the word American or America or Jesus. America or Jesus. So blank is the world's best last hope. Blank is the savior of the world. Blank is, or or we must keep blank first in our hearts, and blank is the light and the glory of the nations. Now, I think you might be surprised as to who uh, said these by putting in the word America. America is the world's best last hope. That was Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. America is the savior of the world was Woodrow Wilson. You may not know him. He was the president of the states from 1913 to 1921. We must keep America first in our hearts is Donald Trump. 
America is the light and the glory among the nations. That also is Donald Trump. Now, as Christians, we have to be careful about where our primary allegiance lies. It can't be in a personality cult. It can't be tied to one particular party. Our allegiance as Christians is with God. Christian nationalists sometimes mix faith and politics. Aren't Christian nationalists just people who love their country? No. Many people are patriotic. You can love country, but sometimes people mix these two and they can't separate the two. For example, many Christians in both Canada and the States think that our constitutions were somehow arranged and put together by evangelical Christians. Actually, Adams and Jefferson in the States and Franklin publicly denied the Trinity, denied biblical inspiration, and the supernatural. They believe in a God who ruled the world who sometimes answered people's prayers. Many of the founders of the Constitution of the States were actually deists. Deists aren't Christians. A deist is a person who believes in a God who created the world and everybody and everything in it and then left it and has distanced himself from it and is not involved in people's lives personally and is not involved in the events of history. What about this term? Oh, I'll just say a little bit more. Christian nationalists really fuse faith and country. No single country is God's chosen nation today. Israel was God's chosen nation. We read that in Scripture in Exodus 19.6. But in Jesus, his church has now that special status. We read that in 1 Peter 2.9. God no longer has a chosen nation. He has a chosen people who come from all of the nations. C.S. Lewis once said this, Patriotic love for a country isn't aggressive. It does not dominate others or demand uniformity. Instead, patriotism includes cheering and chanting for your country in the Olympics and then wishing the best for everyone else, win or lose. Christians are citizens of heaven first and then of whatever country they belong to second. But what about this term evangelical? Today, some people link evangelical and evangelicalism with politics, particularly American politics. Now, I'm hoping here we at ECBC, Evangelical Chinese Bible Church, can focus more on the historical definition of that term evangelical. The news governments, they have hijacked, both in Canada and the States, they've hijacked this term. Historically, the term evangelical has had nothing to do with political affiliation. Historically, it has to do with the belief that the Bible is God's inspired word, that it has authority over our lives, and that we believe that Jesus is the unique son of the living God, God in the flesh. The term evangelical comes from ancient Greek, from the word evangelion, which means good news, and the word evangelos, which means announcing that good news. In other words, historically, evangelicals have been people who believe this is God's word, salvation comes through Jesus Christ, and let's go and tell people about it. It's had nothing to do with political affiliation, has had everything to do with being affiliated with a local church, involved in that church. It has everything to do with the belief that the scriptures, both old and new, are, inspired, are the inspired word of God without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for the salvation of people, and the divine and final authority for all Christian faith and life. That comes straight from our ECBC website. As Christians, we're called by God to live in the world, and yet we're called to be separate from it. Many of us would like you know, precise guidelines, 
precise rules about how we're to live. And there are rules in Scripture. But God also gives us guidelines. He wants us to use our minds to discern how we're to live in this world. God asks you and I to love him with all of our heart, our soul, our strength, and our minds. Because he wants relationship with us. He wants us to to think through what his word means. He doesn't always give us black and white because he wants us to think. And thinking, I know, is hard. We don't want choices. We just want A or B. And sometimes God gives us several good choices, and he wants us to apply our minds and spiritual discernment to situations that we're in. And this unsettles some of us. We want life to be simpler. Instead, God calls us to think, to love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And this, again, requires us to take time. It means going to more than one news source for our news. It means that we have to be aware of the algorithms that are on the Internet, that are controlling what information we're getting based on our likes and dislikes. It means that we need to spend time talking to each other, recognizing there's people in our congregation who have different opinions about how we should apply God's Word to this particular situation. We need to hear from each other, why do you think the way that you think? If we only go to a church where everybody thinks just like we do, if we only listen to people online who are preaching sermons that we already agree with, that they're only parroting what we've already agreed with, if we're only going to discuss with people who have the same opinion as ourselves, how are we going to be stretched and grow in our faith with Jesus Christ and our knowledge about the world that we're called to live in, you and I have a common faith in Jesus Christ. You and I have a desire to live our lives in a way that honors him. But we may have differences of of opinions. We need each other. We need to have those conversations with each other. Why do you think the way you do? Maybe I need to rethink how I apply this scripture to this situation. Scripture tells us to test, to hear, sorry, to test what we hear, to be aware of rumors, to be aware that a time will come where people will gather around them those who will tell them only what they want to hear. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. 1 Timothy 5, 21 again says this, test everything, hold on to what's good, reject everything that's evil. Bank tellers can tell often fake bills from real bills because they've handled the real bills so much. When a fake bill comes, they may not know exactly what's wrong with it, but they're touching and saying, this doesn't quite feel right. You and I need to read our Bibles regularly. You and I need to read our Bibles often so that when something comes along that sounds not quite right, we may not know exactly what's wrong with it, but we'll say, no, something's not right here. And we need each other. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray? Father, we come before you at a time where there is great confusion, polarization, um, divisions, in our society and the societies around us. Lord, you call us to be engaged in this world. It's hard, Lord. It's hard for us to separate uh, what's true and what's not true. But Lord, we love you. We want to follow. We want to be faithful to you. We ask that you please give us wisdom. Please give us discernment. Please uh, help us as we discern right from wrong, truth from error. And help us, Lord, as your people to stay united, to be an example to the world of what it means to know the living God, what it means to be wisdom, to be wise, wisdom based on what we see in Scripture, what we know from you. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you. We pray for your help, your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen.